Hi everybody, my name is Nico Lamanen. I'm the founder of Consensus Network, a freedom publishing house. And today we're gonna be talking about if it's necessary to make more Bitcoin books. So do we really need another, yet another Bitcoin book? And the panel is gonna be the perfect for it because we have Knut Swanholm, um, the author of Praxeology, among other books. Uh, we have Lynn Alden, author of Broken Money. And we have Avi Bura, the author of 24, which is a fiction book related to the Bitcoinverse. Of course, if you ask my opinion as a publisher, my answer is um, pretty obvious. Yes, we need more books, but why? That's not necessarily obvious. So to provide insight and uh, nuance, we have our panel here. If you have any questions for the panel, just save it to the end. We're going to reserve a little bit of time so we can uh, pick the brain of, of these wonderful authors. And uh, just to kick things off, you know, I think the authors are sort of, when they make a book, they make a portion of the brain human readable to others. And with that, maybe we can start with, uh, with Avi at the end and then go through the panel and just a uh, free open floor. Tell us why do we need another book? Why do you write Bitcoin books? Go ahead, Avi. Yeah. <clears throat> so my, as Nico said, uh, my book is called 24. It's a book of fiction. Uh, I believe the first long form b book of fiction on Bitcoin. And ever since I was a kid, I, I, I loved fiction and I stayed away from nonfiction. In fact, the first time I picked up a nonfiction book to read was when I started going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It was probably the Bitcoin standard or uh, one of those sort of uh, seminal Bitcoin works. And until then, it's, I, I, I read a lot, but it was mostly fiction. And that's because I enjoyed stories. Uh, and I think stories have this way of, of bringing concepts to the fore um, and and I and one, when I looked around and you have some amazing Bitcoin authors like Knut and, and Lynn who uh, Knut with with uh, praxeology uh, and just using deductive reasoning to understand concepts of Bitcoin and beyond Lynn with her engineering background just and who can so clearly break down difficult concepts in an easy to understand way and and you, know, you allow people to understand Bitcoin at an intellectual level. I felt there was a space given what I was interested in, to allow people to connect uh, with Bitcoin at an emotional level, right? And I'm, so I'm going to do the thing that I don't like doing, which is comparing Bitcoin to religion. Uh, and in any major religion, God reveals himself through stories. And I thought, why not have the same thing in Bitcoin? So 24 is, is a story that I wanted to write, and I, and I hope people can make that emotional connection to this hero's journey of, this, of the protagonist from becoming a blockchain uh, um, shitcoiner to a Bitcoin maximalist. Thanks. Yeah, from from my perspective, it basically comes down to everybody has a certain audience that they resonate with um, and speak to, and there's obviously there's countless of those, right? So there's there's kids books, there's books that are meant for kind of an institutional audience. There's a book coming out focusing on um, Bitcoin from an academic perspective, from an academic press. Um, there's you know. There's, books called things like uh, Bitcoin Money You Can't Fuck With, right? Right in the title, it kind of sets a tone for what kind of reader they might want to come into this. Um, and so there's so many different, and the, you know, there's short Bitcoin books that kind of, you know, you can read it in one sitting, and then there's very long, comprehensive books that kind of bring you through kind of like, like my focus on the longer side of things, which is a, a more of an investment to read it, um, but then it kind of gives a, a more sweeping overview. Um, and so I generally find that that, you know, if you're in a, and if you're in a position where there's a certain audience that you can speak to that hasn't been served yet or hasn't been, say, directly served um, in the space, it certainly makes sense to reach out to them and, and basically describe it. Because Bitcoin is one of those things where it's so, on some level, it's so simple. But on the other hand, it's so complex because it's so multifaceted. So it, it's got an economic side to it. It's got a technical side to it. It's got a socio-political side to it. There's multiple different lenses that you can look at it through. There's multiple things that it affects uh, in the grand scheme of things. And so because it's so multidisciplinary, it inherently is one of those things that kind of requires quite, quite a bit of content to fully understand it. And if you look at, you know, some of the OG Bitcoiners back, you know, 10 plus years ago, they didn't have a lot of resources um, to, to kind of get into the space and, and figure things out. And so it's easier now for people to, to understand the asset and the network um, than it was years ago because there's been so much content. There's podcasts, there's books. Um, there's articles and I guess what makes a book unique is that it's kind of a longer form. And so like, I generally find that 
when people are reading my articles, they say, well, which one should I start with or what order should I read them in? And it's a little bit of a mess in that sense. Each one kind of touches on a subject. But if you want to bring the reader through kind of a, a fuller story in, in an order that you think makes sense, that's where a book stands out. And, you know, it's not that I think a book's for everyone. Some people prefer not to read books. They prefer to um, consume content in other ways. It could be through um, podcasts. It could be through shows. It could be through shorter articles that they read. But there is a pretty significant set that does like to um, read full books. And they like to kind of get that more immersive, more complete experience. And so there's, you know, there's billions of people in the world. Some significant subset of them do like to read books. And there's, you know, there's every language, every kind of different type of audience member you're speaking to, there's a certain book that can, that can t uh, connect to them, make them see what you see in a way that other books haven't yet or other types of content haven't yet. Yeah, I, I'd uh, like to echo what my, what my fellow authors have, uh, here have said. Uh, and let just add um, that maybe the most obvious uh, answer to the question, do we need more Bitcoin books, is do we need more Bitcoin hats? And we obviously do, and Abby is a, a great addition to that thing. Uh, many of us Bitcoin bo book authors have hats, not Lynn, yet. But we'll see in the future. Work on her. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I'd like to just like to add, like the um, this, there are an infinite amount of sub caverns or an infinite number of sub caverns to the rabbit hole to to dive into, and also adjacent subjects like fraxiology, for instance, or Austrian economics in general, but also a lot of philosophy, a lot of like books on game theory, books on statistics, uh, like. There are so many different subjects to study here that are adjacent to Bitcoin. Uh, and if you extrapolate far ahead and far enough into the future, all books will be Bitcoin books. Because if we believe in hyper-Bitcoinization and we think this thing is going to take over, then this thing is going to touch everything. It, it already is touching everything to us in this room. We've already felt it like that this, this is part of our lives now. And so, so I don't think a Bitcoin book will be specifically a Bitcoin book. It will more be like all books will be Bitcoin books in some way, shape or form. Yeah, that's a very interesting point you bring out. We actually talked about this yesterday in, the, in another panel about Bitcoin and fiction. And the, I would ask you the question, does it make all books Bitcoin books or does it make no books Bitcoin books? You know what I mean? Like once Bitcoin becomes the mundane, um, every book is just a book, right? It's just a story. Like what's what's the angle then? Like where are you going to go from there? Where are you going to expand? Who do you write for and why? I, I mean, like books Books is one medium. And we had a panel of, of filmmakers here just before us. And those are connected. But there are also like shit posters. That's another thing. And meme makers... There are so many different things to do now. Like <laughs> being being a music artist back when I grew up meant you made albums, but it doesn't have to mean that at all now. And being a filmmaker doesn't have to mean that you make two-hour movies. And you know, being an author doesn't have to necessarily mean that you writing books is the only thing you do. Uh, all these things are connected. And during this gold rush phase, or whatever you may call it. Like the more the the more we are, the merrier. And just follow your passions and write if you want to write, because writing can be is very rewarding in itself if you can actually enjoy the process. I agree with that. Yeah, Avi, um, we talked yesterday about Orange Peeling the Heart. You specifically talked about that. Maybe go in a little bit into in into that, and uh, let's talk about Orange Peeling the Heart versus Orange Peeling the Mind. Yeah, before that, Nick, I just want to address your point about, well, will no books be Bitcoin books when Bitcoin becomes mundane? Remember, that is, we're talking about hyper-Bitcoinization, which is an incredible world of abundance and everyone's happy, there's no war, right? So all we, all we can do then, all, all we have left to do is to, is to create. So, it, so to me, it's, it, that's a, something to look forward to and maybe no books are about Bitcoin, but that's because the world has changed. Yeah, look, I, uh, on orange pulling the heart versus the brain, I, I touched upon this in my earlier point, right? You have, uh, we have authors like Knuth and, and Lynn uh, who make fantastic intellectual arguments. Uh, what I, when I take a step back, 
um, and and think about what I really want as a Bitcoiner is I want the world, as much of the world to be using Bitcoin as, as possible because I want that hyper Bitcoinized world, right? And to me, for adoption to so we're talking about adoption, right? And for adoption to scale, uh, I think that that emotional connection to this technology or what that or what that technology allows humanity to achieve is in my mind is what's going to drive uh, drive that at, at scale so that's why uh you know again taking that uh, religion metaphor again so many religions rely on allegory and and stories and poetry and songs uh to promote this concept of god so that you know it's they're using this multi-dimensional canvas uh to tap into the the senses of, of individuals to draw them into their fold and I think there is an opportunity here with, with Bitcoin to uh, to do that through stories, through the filmmaker panel we had right before. We have some musicians now uh, who are making Bitcoin music. Uh, so I think if you can draw people in through that emotional connection, administer the orange pill in the heart, um, I, I I think this uh, we can scale adoption a lot faster. Yeah. Well, one point I'll make is like, so there's a book that came out a, maybe a couple of years ago called Central Banking 101. And it's a book about how basically the central banking system works, how different layers build on top of it. And at this point, central banking is mundane in the sense that it's been around for a very long time, but it's still a, a fairly poorly understood topic for a lot of people. And so, you know, there's a number of books on it, you know, not a ton. And he wrote, um, Joseph Wang wrote it, he wrote a fairly concise book. There was just like, you know, if you, you can read it in a couple sittings and it's about the mechanics of, of central banking and it's good for that purpose. And it just shows that, you know, there could be things that are around for a very long time that is still, um, you know, a book about how it works or a book about how it affects this other thing are still relevant. And so I think even in the future, especially because, you know, Bitcoin in some small way evolves over time or things on top of it evolve over time and, and kind of how we interpret it evolves over time. And so some of the Bitcoin books in the past two years are a little bit different than Bitcoin books from five, six, seven, eight years ago. And you can imagine if, if, you know, there's a Bitcoin book 20 years from now, even if Bitcoin's way bigger and more kind of widely understood in general, there still might be new angles about it. Bitcoin m might look a little bit different than it does right now, kind of like how now it looks a little bit different than it did 10 years ago. Um, and so I think that there's always a world where you're describing in modern terms how something works. You know, there's, there's classics of economics from you know, a hundred years ago or sometimes more. And sometimes they're kind of challenging to read. The language is, is a little bit older, uh, not not kind of the modern parlance. And so, for example, like Safedine wrote Principles of Economics, which touches on a lot of the same economic concepts that were, say, presented by Mises and others. But he, he puts it in in a in modern parlance in a digestible form in the, in the format that he felt was, was good. And I think it's a great book. And so I think there's actually quite a bit of... Um, work to be done even just on our existing systems and of course bitcoin's in this moment where it's you know it's 15 years old it's still fairly new most people still don't understand it a lot it's 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 in that kind of rapid growth phase and so this is obviously the era where there's you know there's a million pieces of content coming out about it to, to you know get people to go from not understanding it or even being kind of an having an adversarial understanding of it to kind of pulling them in to say okay this is how it works it's maybe not what you thought it was maybe you're you're your concerns around the energy usage is not uh, correct. Here's why, or here's you know here's why deflation. Uh, here's like the defense for deflation. For example, Jeff Booth focused his entire book on why deflation is a good thing, even though in in modern kind of economic understanding, most people their knee jerk assumption is deflation is a bad thing, right? And so there's always these little angles that are worth exploring, especially in this era. But even in the future, I think there'll always be something something that worth exploring, worth educating, worth reinterpreting. That's very interesting. Like it's it's a great point Lim brings out that we have all this information that has become mundane, maybe prematurely, sort of. I, I think that's what you're saying. So Lynn, you have an engineering background. I, I really like your your takes that are a little bit more based and more, let's say, sober, uh, when you when you read that <laughs> Bitcoin Twitter. So I guess you're you're saying that orange peeling the mind still uh, holds uh, holds a big place uh, in, in your writings. And uh, maybe we should shine a light to these things before they become mundane. Like, do we run a risk of Bitcoin becoming mundane before it's widely understood, understood enough? I, I think so. And I think one of the one of the funny things is when people say, oh, Bitcoin's too complex, people won't understand it. And it's like, well, how many people know how the dollar system works? It's like under the surface, like it seems simple. It's a dollar's a dollar. 
as you look under the surface, it's the whole euro dollar system. So all the offshore dollars or repo and reverse repo and all these kind of mechanics. Like that's why Central Banking 101 is a book that actually educated a lot of people, even though it's literally about the foundation of how the dollar works essentially. And so I think there are a lot of a lot of things that are mundane, but still not widely understood. And for a lot of people with Bitcoin, for example, when it, when they first hear about it, they get kind of a cursory understanding of it. And then they that, that becomes their mental model for the next several years until something changes it, right? And, and often people's first impression is, is negative, right? They say, oh, that's like the magic internet money. It's, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. And it takes them a, no, a number of more touches to do it. Maybe it's a book that finally convinces them because it's a book that speaks to them in a way that other books had not, right? So for example, you, you mentioned my work tends to be, you know, quote, sober. It, it's kind of, I purposely try to use language that, for example, a, when a CEO reads the book, he can then give copies to his friends, which, which has happened, for example, with Broken Money. And there's a certain audience there that um, I want to make the book um, accessible to in a way that other books might not be accessible to that group. But there might be, you know, for my book, there are people that don't want to sit down and read a 500-page book. So there's books that were mine's, mine's not the, the speed that they want to go on. They want to go on something else. And I think that's important because there's you want to hit the, the audience that you feel has been underserved or even if they've been somewhat served, it's just the audience that you're capable of speaking to uh, well, and, and there's a market for that. Yeah, I think we are, we are arriving to the key point here. Like there's, there's an audience for all kinds of books and accessibility, in my opinion, is the key word here, like to ma- meet people where they are. And I think with that, we can go to Knut because Knut, you write for a very specific audience as well, maybe. maybe yeah. So if you want a not so sober book that is not five hours long, you know where to go. Like, <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to add to that, like echoing what uh, Avi said about uh, this religious aspect. When I wrote the first book, like the second chapter in that is called Financial Atheism, because I view Bitcoin as like the first, the first type of money where you don't need belief or dogmatic thinking to to understand it. You can trust. You, you can verify and you don't have to trust. And and this plays into yeah what Lynn said about like, fuck your money. You can also view Bitcoin as being love, which are sort of polar opposites. So there are all of these dichotomies, like polar opposite angles that you can approach this subject from. And it still makes sense somehow. I know so many people in this space who've like come from completely different backgrounds than I have and approach the whole thing from a completely different set of beliefs or a different set of books that they read. Uh, Rob Breedlove is the the guy I bring up here mostly because we had read a completely different set of books. We both read a lot of books and ended up with the same conclusions from totally different angles. Uh, And I find that so insanely fascinating. And to me, that that is telling that there's there's some kernel of truth here that you can that you can find th- that you will end up with regardless of your starting point if that makes sense yeah that's it. very interesting like it's almost like the literally shelling point of bitcoin books and i guess my question then for you guys in the panel is that can we expand the shelling point like can we make the landing zone a little bit bigger and and if so what what are the a shelling landing pad like <laughs> yeah. Instead of a point, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's it's like increase the increase the landing area, the soft landing area, <laughs> um, where where people may land and learn about this technology. And moreover, to that, like two sided question: Is it even necessary? Like we were talking about, like religious dogma and stuff like that. That has been seemed to work pretty well for humans in general, like in um, directing masses. So, is it even necessary? to offer this wide landing space for a wide range of people or should we rather focus on orange peeling very specific thought leaders let's say for lack of a better word that will then lead these people into the so-called promised land hyper-bitcoinization better world whatever you want to call it how do you want to take it Bob? i think we all already have a widening landing pad right it, it, it's not a i mean we have books that address different aspects of Bitcoin culture, uh, Bitcoin thought, uh, the engineering a- angles, and so on. So, um, and to your question about whether we t- we have a targeted list of or, or folks to orange build, I I don't think so. I think we should cast a wide net in in that regard, um, and and draw, try to draw as many people in uh, as we can. 
Yeah, like I mean, there is there was another recent book called "A Progressive's Case for Bitcoin," right? So historically, most of most of the early literature has been more libertarian, more conservative. Um, but this was a progressive that likes Bitcoin and wanted, and that's not that's an audience that's been not well kind of covered in the Bitcoin space, and so he wanted to share it with his fellow progressives, and it's it, it's a market for that. And I think you know Alex Gladstein of the Human Rights Foundation. Um, you know, he, he focuses on that kind of content for people that are in more of the human rights space that are not necessarily going in to read about Bitcoin per se, but they want to hear about ultimately how, you know, the financial system is unjust in many ways in many places and how things like Bitcoin or in some cases, stable coins can address that and give people more options in the jurisdictions that they're in. And then I, I find, for example, that one, that, that, HRF kind of human rights angle goes pretty far with a lot of people that were maybe skeptical of Bitcoin. And then they hear, well, okay, this person was in this hyperinflationary environment and they, with Bitcoin, they could bring it and they could actually, you know, bring their value outside of the country or they could kind of save where their neighbors couldn't. And when someone hears that argument, there's very little they can say against it. Right. And so that, that's, a, for example, that's a niche that was for a period of time somewhat underserved. And when it really got emphasis, I think it went a long way both for, you know, everyday people and for certain thought leaders. And so there's, you know, there's certain books that are going to be aimed at thought leaders or other books can be aimed at a more general audience or a basic audience or, or kids books. There's like kids um, illustrated books about Bitcoin, for example, um, which makes sense because there's, you know, there's kids books for really basic economics too. And so it makes sense that especially we're in a more digital world now and having a, a Bitcoin book for kids makes sense. And, you know, one thing about me is like I, I was hesitant to write my book originally because I actually was thinking there's there's plenty of Bitcoin books. Um, I had written tons of articles and I'm like some of them were almost like short books themselves. Like that that's clearly should be sufficient. And writing a book, especially a long one, you know, it's very long. It's very tedious to, to write it. Um, it's you, you generally don't write a book for great ROI compared to other things you could be doing to, to monetize. You don't really do it for the money for the most part. Um, but for me, I did it just because there was a certain set of themes that I wanted to touch on that I didn't see fully addressed in other books. I felt that the niche that was potentially missing was that really long form deep dive and the type of Bitcoin book that doesn't have Bitcoin in the title and Bitcoin doesn't really come up until the final third. You kind of focus on all the problems with the kind of the current system and educating how the current system works and why it came to be the way it is and eventually getting to Bitcoin. That's the angle that I wanted to take, with, with which was an, an angle that you know, there's other books where Bitcoin's in the title. People come to it specifically because they want to learn about Bitcoin, whereas mine was almost like sneaking it in there. Like you want to learn why, why is money not working well? And then eventually it comes to things like Bitcoin and, and how that can address some of the things that are not working well. Okay. Okay. Uh, Knut, so, so just hold on a second. Okay. I just want to dig a little bit deeper on, on Lynn because I, I, I find your book, Broken Money, specifically fascinating because it uh, arrived into a sort of saturated market, in my opinion. But you seem to be able to make it uh, a big success, as far as I can tell. So, what's the what's the secret sauce? Like, what's walk us through the process? I, th I think a lot of it was that it was a passion project. So, I I didn't write one until I knew I could write a good one. Like, I didn't write one for the sake of writing one, um, which is why for like again, I was like, okay, it's already a pretty crowded field. Um, it's a very time consuming thing. Is it something I really want to get into? And like I was actually, I was in Egypt when I decided to write. I was sitting down at lunch with some friends and I was kind of like, should I or shouldn't I not? And I was kind of like, my, my friends were kind of, we all kind of, I kind of left it on them and they all kind of agreed I should. And so a year later when I was back in Egypt, I had, I had the prototype in my hand and I was like, well, it's your guy's fault. This is why it happened. Um, and so for me, it was something that I really put off for a long time, but once I decided to do it, it's because all the pieces had fallen into my head, and so it came out really quickly for the size of book it is. And because I, I just put so much time into making sure it's the, it's the quality that I wanted it to be, and that it, it, it did come at things in, a, in an angle that's not been, say, fully covered by other books yet. Um, and so I, th I think it did well. And partially, it's just if you have a big platform, a big audience, um, if you do a book, it's probably going to do reasonably well. Um, but I really try to put that extra effort into it to make it so that even if, even if it did come from say a, someone with a less well-known audience that hopefully was still spread because of the quality itself. Um, but the, yeah, the short answer was not writing it until I was sure that I could write the book I wanted to write, not just a book for the book's sake. That's excellent. Good. You are uh, basically the same question. What's, what's your process? And after that, maybe we go into the audience questions. 
Yeah, two points. Uh, like, uh, first of all, I think if you're not writing the book the way you described, Lynn, like that you're doing it because you're passionate, then you probably shouldn't write the book at all. Like, that's you're writing it for yourself. Like with a like with any creative process. I heard who was that? Bob Rock, like the rock producer, talk about this. That uh, your job as the creative is to make the best product you can and be as honest as possible in making it, being honest to yourself and making it for your, for your own pleasure. And whatever happens to the product afterwards is not in your control, and it shouldn't be. Your job is to make, the, make it the best you can. And creativity is a, is a weird beast to try to tame because there's no way of predicting when you're going to start writing. Like I've been wanting to write a book for a long, uh, another book for a long time, and I couldn't write a single word until sometime this December when I started writing and then just it poured out. So there's a new book coming, <laughs> just like to announce that. Uh, and also I was on a similar panel to this one in Amsterdam with Jason Mayer, uh, Progressive's Case for Bitcoin and Alex Svetsky. And from what I understood, Alex is working on the fascist case for Bitcoin, just as a counterpart to the Progressive's Case. And I, I'm not sure how that project is going, but I'm, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll make sure to like push it so, so we can see some progress. One, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, let's take some uh, couple, couple questions from the audience, maybe, the authors. Is there an area within the space that you think is particularly underdeveloped and is ripe for messaging that isn't really out there yet and fully developed? that you think is the next place we're going to start seeing more material in? Surrealist poetry. I'm not joking. I would say that the fact that Bitcoin is just information is vastly under underexplored. The 12 magic words are actually magic. That's underexplored. I think maybe Bitcoin fiction. Yeah, that's that's still in its fairly early phase. There's, you know, there's not, not many of them. Um, and, you know, I think there's a handful that I know of that are coming out. Um, but yeah, basically fiction that maybe is not directly about Bitcoin, maybe not the entire topics about it, but that it incorporates it in some meaningful way um, so that someone comes across it without necessarily going out to read a, a nonfiction book that describes how Bitcoin works, right? I think there's a lot of books now about how Bitcoin works. I think there, there will be more in the future because, again, there's still more audiences that can be brought to learn how Bitcoin works. But I think that that fiction side is, is maybe underserved. I think if we were have if you, I got that question a few years ago, I probably would have said something like the progressive case for Bitcoin, because you want to you want to protect your left flank a little bit. If if you know if Bitcoin, say in the United States, for example, was most people on the right liked it and everybody on the left hated it, then it becomes a, a partisan issue. Whereas if you can get like you know ten percent of the left to like it too, then you you're pretty much covered in terms of really draconian legislation coming after you right so i think that was a that was an important book to kind of even if even for people obviously that are not progressive just the fact that there's some some percentage of progressives that don't hate you anymore because of that book is helpful and i think so but i think fiction's a, an, an area that i would like to see more of probably I, I, I totally agree with that and you know i think fiction answers the question that most people have like i don't care about bitcoin why should i care and you can explore implications in a, in a fictitious environment way better. Abhi, did you have anything to add for the comment? No, no, I think there's a question. Next what, question. What was the original inspiration like that gave you the idea for the book for each of you? O original inspiration? Yeah, like insp that inspired your first idea to start the book. Oh, it depends on which book you're talking about. but <laughs> Your most recent ones, like the... But the the one I'm writing now it was the conversations on the pod like we've we've had so many good conversations with so many interesting people so uh, th there are so many ideas that like percolate and then become become something else and uh, at some point you have a critical mass of ideas that is uh, interesting enough to start exploring them on a deeper level I think that's yeah so talking to other Bitcoiners is a good good start. For me, it was my article. I wrote an article called What is Money? It's my longest article. Uh, it's almost like a short book in its own right. Um, and I I felt like that's something I could eventually expand into a book to kind of cover things in more complete topics. Um, originally, I thought my book was going to kind of make more use of my existing articles. Like some people will put out a number of articles and kind of make a compilation book. I was originally thinking that route, but I eventually kind of just read it with entirely fresh perspective. 
but basically all of my prior articles were the inspiration that ultimately led to the the, the main book yeah look uh, i wanted to have fun write something that i thought was beautiful and i want and something that i thought people would enjoy and have fun doing and one of the things in my book 24 is there is a hidden bounty there is a seed phrase right now that stands that, that uh, address holds 15 million sats which is t almost ten thousand dollars at today's exchange rate so uh, you read the book, there are clues in there to the bounty, and have fun. There may or may not be such a seed phrase in all of my books as well. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. And with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Thanks, for everybody, for your attention. Thank you, for the Thank you very much. And be sure to go to the book corner, pick up the, the books by these authors, have them signed. If you're interested in uh, Freedom Publishing, you want to publish a book, I'm going to be talking about that in the book corner right after this. Thank you.